maybe there's some players that are just never ever folding to me. Then I'll like make a crazy play that as, you know, at least like justifiable, that's reasonable. Daniel Jungleman Cates, um dos jogadores de maior sucesso no mundo do poker, possuindo mais de 10 milhões de dólares em lucro em mesas de cash game online. Além disso, ele é bicampeão nos anos de 2022 e 2023 daquele que é considerado o torneio mais difícil da WSOP, o Players Championship. E além de tudo isso, ele também acumula mais de 14 milhões de dólares em premiações em torneios torneios ao vivo ao longo da sua carreira. E é exatamente ele que eu trouxe para analisar uma mão que ele mesmo jogou no Hustler Casino Live ano passado. Então vem comigo nesse vídeo, vamos analisar essa mão junto e ver como uma das mentes mais brilhantes do poker atual pensa. Vamos nessa. So, with this introduction, let's get right into the hand. Ace King, Dan's got jacks. Hold on to your hat here. We know one jack is dead and Mars is actually a three better. So Dan is on the hijack. He opened for 1.2, 1200. And Mars, three bet on the cutoff. And Andy just cold calls the three bet. Let's talk first of all this three bet with Queen 10 off. How do you think this is profitable? Do you think you can make some money out of that by being in position, being able to put in a lot of pressure? I think this is one of these plays. I don't really like it, to be honest. I don't really know a whole lot about this Dan guy. He seemed to play solid, actually kind of reasonable. It's only really justifiable um, kind of under similar conditions as the 9-4 off where people are really loose and they really like kind of weak tight the rest of the hand and uh, fold a little bit too much and play a little bit too straightforward. It's, it's not really something you can do. I don't like doing stuff like this too much. It's one of these things that's kind of out of line to be honest. Uh, you can get away with it from a fish that opens too much. I think then it's justifiable or you know a bad rig or whatever but otherwise it's kind of it's not really a winning play. The, Ace King is okay. I still think he should probably call four bet just because people are kind of paralyzed against that and it's just too powerful with Ace King specifically. But whatever. I mean, fine. So you think like just going back a little bit about the Queen 10 off. So you think when Mars is three betting this Queen 10 off, the only way that it could be good if it was versus a recreational player that might be opening too much. But versus a rag, you just go ahead and fold this in his shoes, right? Yeah, it's it, it, you need a you need a shitty rag for this or you need someone who's opening a lot specifically and not formatting that much because you cannot continue with Quinton offsuit versus format. Um, it's, but with Mars's image, it's better actually because he's tight so he can get away with his stuff. Like no one thinks Mars is running like a bunch of crazy bluffs. All right, so Andy, he cold called. We talked a little bit about that and now let's see a little bit more of the hand here. Jungle Man having some uh, some evil thoughts. He is, oh my. There's 4,000 for you to call. You decided to four bet to 18,000. Mm -hmm. From what you said about Andy's play here, I believe the main reason you might be for betting this, amongst the thing that you talked a little bit about in the beginning of the video, is because his range usually looks like shit on the button, just cold calling, and this is like an exception, right? Um, it's that, plus the fact that I think both Dan and Mars are just gonna like toss their hands. And like, what's going through their heads, I think a lot of the time is, I have no idea what Jungle Man has, blah, 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 blah. So it gets a really difficult spot for them in the four bet pots later on in the hand. And I think that it's gonna be very hard for them. It's gonna be in the situation where, I think I end up doing pretty well in the situation where they're range are kind of pigeonholed and mine is not you know just weird stuff like this happens and it, it's just a difficult spot in general where they're like highly likely to play a little bit too tight would you do that with that type of hand if you were on tv if this was in a, a streaming or there's a huge factor on it being streamed for you to do something like that i actually I might, but more in a private cash game. In a public cash game, no. Mostly no. Let's put it that way. I guess I did do something similar in a tournament where yeah, I thought it was okay, but it, it probably was okay. It's just, yeah, yeah, it's not something that I recommend. <laughs> Jokers. It's hard to imagine jacks are good right now. I'm, I'm very intrigued to see how this plays out. Jacks go in the muck. You can't blame him. Queen 10 goes in the muck. Don't think he folds. Nope, he's gonna call. Jax, as you said, will probably fold. Ended up folding. Queen 10 off, of course, ended up folding. And then decided to call here with your 
stack being the effective stack. What do you think about his play? Would you do something different here? Maybe just I, jams, I, I some kind of trap preflop? I would not have uh, gotten Dylan's money. If I was Dylan, I wouldn't have done that. And what about Andy? What do you think of his play here? Sure. I think call is great. Okay, so... I don't like 5-betting, really. All right. So no 5 betting here, especially being this deep. Let's take a flop. Let's see what the flop may bring us. Now, by the way, there's a bout... We'll call it 21,000. Ah. All right, let's talk a little bit about your reactions here on the table. Do you have a lot of control on how you react, how you portray yourself at the table, or like just do whatever's in your mind? Do you have kind of a strategy, a go-to behavior? What what goes through your head when you're behaving at the table here? It depends. I try to do things that are emotionally uh, charged, that are create some kind of reaction, but that's mostly for viewership. And because, I mean, I want to have fun too. It's mostly that. Sometimes, you know, if like Arab or whoever like starts doing this thing where he tries to needle me or whatever i i'm not not the kind of guy well i could just ignore it but i could also play dirty right back that seems to be a fine option so uh you know in that case i'll play dirty right back especially when it's great for tv i've got all the reason to so yeah i don't i don't normally try to play these kind of games unless people start doing it to me and most of the time i just do goofy things like whatever i sometimes do reverse tells i sometimes i do a lot of things but most of the time it's just things that are good for TV and good for the environment, or at least I think that they are. Yeah. Or I mean, sometimes it's also sometimes I mean I have an agenda of like I'm asking a question to get information, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Look, I do worry about tells, but there's many false positives in the first place, and I mean I do things to combat tells, and also like if I don't feel nervous myself, and I'm always natural, like in most small pots, uh, and I'm paying attention, paying attention. There's actually plenty of tells that come from not paying attention, then it's not really a whole lot of issue. Um, um, so yes, I definitely worry about tells, uh, but I don't think that it's, you know, nearly as big of a deal as what people think, because people do different things all the time. It's really hard to know which things are strong and weak by themselves, unless they're like not paying attention. You give away more by not paying attention than like doing something weird in a hand or whatever it is. You, you give away more by not paying attention. You mean when you are in the hand and you're, you're not paying attention to your behavior? What, what do you mean by that? Well, if you always, um, if you at some, at any point, points in the hand really are just kind of checked out like that can be that can be tells that can that like, if you're like you know like one common thing that people do is they you know they're about to fold the hand preflop is they just kind of hold their hand in the muck or like are obviously not going to play it and like that's a tell like that's a really obvious tell like things like that and what about the glasses you're about to talk about the glasses here but what do you think about glasses mostly a yeah. joke i'm just being goofy there's not a whole lot of benefit to wearing glasses let's continue with the hand let's take a look at the flop here okay uh, okay, okay watch jungle man win this there's a nine right. and a four <laughs> unbelievable of course of course <laughs> I mean, here there's right. only one option. It's called bet. Uh, he has eight yeah, highs quite a lot. Um, the question is how much? I actually bet quite small. Um, the true size is actually probably. Um, I mean, normally it would be half pot or something, actually, according to GTO. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, the way GTO plays in comparison to reality, very different. But so I decided that quarter pot, especially with the person to the side, because I know exploitatively speaking, or I know just as pattern wise, that people tend to fold too much when there's like a side pot. It's a bit tricky to play these spots, but uh, that's why I bet so small and he does make the pretty absurd fold in my opinion, but he ended up being right. So what can I say? Yeah, that fold is crazy. Let's, let's take a look at this here. And he does lots of crazy things. Surprisingly, I was actually a bit surprised at some of the things he did. But I'm really surprised at what people do. I think, I, I mean, I, I think I might bet ace queen. The only thing is that I'm worried a bit about whether I beat Dylan or not. I didn't think that he could have his 10. Like, if no. I had 10s, I would certainly bet, though, I can tell you that. Like, I had a pair of 9s, I'd bet. Like, I had a pair of 4s, I'd bet. <laughs> for the showdown, the, the guy in the red just casually seeing your 9 off, 9 4 off suit. <laughs> There's a flush draw. There's a flush draw. He's, he's got 20%, but the main pot is already yours. Let's just take a look at the river. Yeah. Okay. So it goes your way. So just to talk a little bit more about this, what's your plan if you didn't hit your, your pair? If you didn't hit anything, are you planning on going for the three streets? It's very bored dependent. Are well, you planning to see on, that every time? Uh, an, an important factor is the guy that the, the fact that this guy overcalled because now I have to beat him in the hand yeah. when the side pot. But if I make a 
pair, if I make something that can beat him but may not beat the other guy, now I have an interesting situation because now it, it becomes more profitable to do things like, you know, bet with a pair and turn it into a bluff kind of thing. But if I have nothing, then it doesn't make sense for me to bet unless there's money on the side. Or if there's much money on the side, now I need to like play as if it's for the side pot. Um, so I uh, I may have bluffed, let's put it that way. If I hit like a pair or something, I might try to bluff Andy off the best hand. Mm -hmm. Especially if there's money in the middle. If you didn't hit anything on the flop, the flop was like queen, eight, deuce. Are you trying, are you going for a C bet at least or you're just giving up on the flop? That one specifically I might check because he could have ace queen. Um, that's a hand I think is quite likely. Like I think when he calls, his range is something like ace queen, ace king, um, jacks, nines, tens. Like it's almost that precise, but I have a nine. I would have a nine. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I might, I might bet, uh, and decide to bluff. Like if he folds ace king, that's pretty good, especially for a quarter pot. Um, especially he ended up folding here. Yeah. I mean, I guess I got the second best hand or the best hand next to what's his face. Like it doesn't really have right. much else. Like if you know that someone has one of like four hands, it's pretty easy to play against them. Yeah. I noticed those code, code, code versus three bet ranges. They are very, uh, like, Compare how high some suited broadways, some ace queen off, maybe. If they are recreations, they have a little bit more hands, so a little bit more pocket pairs, like seven, sixes. They might have some suited connectors, like eight, seven. But usually, when a reg or a ragish cold calls a three bet, he ended up just having that, that type of range. Maybe not ace queen as much, that ace king, I mean. Ace king is not very common, but ace queen, it's very common. That's why, when... that's why I kind of do like ace king specifically, because ace king will like some boards that you wouldn't expect to be in that range. And like, that's there's not that much EV to four betting it. It's, there's EV to doing anything with it. So it's one of those hands that, uh, yeah, I can see that being a good play. There's many hands that uh, could maybe work for that kind of thing when you're deep. But the the cat the thing needs to be needs to be your deep. And once things start getting deep, I find that people really don't truly do what you're able to do when you're deep or what you're supposed to do according to what the math might imagine you doing. Just that just that people don't explore a lot of true possibilities that are out there that AI by you know being just purely logical and doing what it's supposed to do, it does fine. People simply are a little bit more sheepish that you might, than you might imagine. The word meaning, sheepish. what I mean is that they're falling into these set patterns more than they ought to. It's hard to like find sensible exploits that actually work really well against people. You have to like think deeply about things. So yeah, Jungle, hey man, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, really glad that you ended up accepting doing a YouTube video here. Maybe we can do more in the future. Who knows if you're up for it? Yeah, well, happy to help. Thank you for your patience, guys. Let me know if you have any more questions. E muito obrigado por ter assistido esse vídeo. Se você gostou das dicas que eu passei aqui hoje junto ao Jungle Man, recomendo fortemente que você se inscreva na minha newsletter em que mando dicas semanais diretamente no seu e-mail de como melhorar no poker. E tenho duas recomendações de conteúdo para vocês assistirem agora também. A primeira é um podcast que eu e o Saulo, meu sócio lá na Metagame, participamos do próprio Jungleman ali no canal dele. Um Bate-papo muito legal sobre como a gente vê o futuro do poker e se ainda existe essa possibilidade de se viver de poker. E o segundo é esse outro vídeo aqui em que eu analiso cinco mãos do Tom Duan e chego à conclusão se ele realmente ainda é ou deixou de ser um dos melhores jogadores de poker do mundo. Então é isso, inscreva-se no canal também e vejo vocês no próximo vídeo. Tchau, tchau.